Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session today. Uh, Dave and I will be giving a deep dive of Kubernetes data protection working group. My name is Xin Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud native storage team. I'm also a co-chair of Kubernetes Six Storage and the data protection working group, working with Dave. I'm Dave Smith Uchida. I'm a technical leader at Veeam working on the Kasten K10 product. Here's today's agenda. We will give key updates of the working group. We will talk about who we are and uh, uh, what is the motivation for establishing this working group. And we will discuss some of the projects that we are working on. And finally, how to get involved. Here are some of the key updates. We wrote a white paper on the data protection workflows in Kubernetes. And here's a link to the annual report and also some of the previous talks at KubeCon. Here you can see the companies who are supporting this working group. If your company also is supporting this working group but not showing on this list, please let us know and we can get you added. In Kubernetes, the day one operations for stable workloads are well supported. We have persistent volumes and persistent volume claims for the volume operations. We have workload APIs such as deployments, uh, stable set that you can use to manage your workloads. According to the 2022 survey by Data on Kubernetes community, more and more stable workloads are moving to Kubernetes. There are different types of workloads. There are database workloads. There are AI machine learning, uh, messaging streaming, and other type of uh, workloads as well. Uh, this stable workloads are moving to Kubernetes to take advantage of Kubernetes self-healing ability, uh, portability, scalability, agile deployment, and so on. On the other hand, Day two operations such as data protection is still limited. GitOps workflow has limitations for state for application, secrets, config maps, and your precious data stored in the persistent volumes are not on the Git. So we still need to figure out how to better support data protection in Kubernetes. That's why we formed this working group. We do work with other groups. Seek Storage and uh, Seek Apps are sponsors of this working group. We also work with the Tech Storage on data protection related topics. This shows the backup workflow with existing and missing building blocks in Kubernetes. The blue color shows the process. The green color shows existing building blocks, and yellow ones are uh, uh, work in progress, and then uh, the orange ones are missing building blocks. When you take a backup of an application, we need to backup both Kubernetes metadata and the volume data. To backup volume data, there are mainly two ways. You can use the native data dump, such as MySQL dump, or you could use the controller coordinated approach, which will take a volume snapshot or a backup. And before taking a snapshot, we first want to quiet ask the application. And after taking the snapshot, we want to unquiet the application. Both the metadata and data are um, exported into a backup repository. The backup repository is a repo or location that you can use to store the data and metadata. Uh, we have uh, some existing features in Kubernetes. Uh, Seek Apps has this uh, application CRD. And we also have a volume snapshot. That's a feature that has been GA since 1.20 release. And we also have a cozy consistent group snapshot a volume mode conversion, which I will go over later. 
This shows the restore workflow with existing and missing building blocks. To restore the application, we first need to import the backup from the backup repository. Then we need to restore Kubernetes metadata, including PVPVCs. And we need to re restore the, the volume data, depending on how the data is backed up. If it's uh, backed up natively, then we need to restore from the native data dump. Otherwise, uh, we will rehydrate PVC from volume snapshot or volume backup. And there is a feature, uh, it's a beta feature called the volume populator, which is very useful when we are doing a restore. It allows you to rehydrate the PVC from an external data source, such as a backup, not just from a volume snapshot or another PVC. This also supports the wait for first consumer volume binding mode and it uh, allows the PV to be created, populated with the data, and also make sure that the PV PVC are uh, bound. So when you create a PVC from a volume snapshot, you can change the volume mode from file system to raw block, uh, but it is possible that it could introduce vulnerability to the kernel. But on the other hand, doing this uh, volume mode uh, transition is a valid use case because we want to do efficient backups. We want to be able to retrieve change blocks. That's why we introduced this feature to prevent unauthorized volume mode conversion. We added a source volume mode field in the volume snapshot content and also an annotation on the uh, volume snapshot content called allow volume mode change. So when you take a snapshot, the external snapshotter, uh, the snapshotter controller will um, populate this source volume mode field based on the PVC's volume mode. And when you create a PVC from the volume snapshot, then the external provisioner will check uh, the, the source volume mode and you are new volume mode in the in your new PVC, and if they are different, then uh, it's going to check if there is this uh, annotation added on volume snapshot content. If it's not there, then the operation will be rejected. Otherwise, it is allowed. And this feature is targeting GA in 1.30 release, and feature flag is enabled in both uh, the snapshotter and the uh, provisioner. So uh, if your application uh, relies on this uh, workflow, then action is required. You must make a change in your code. Otherwise, uh, your application will fail. So this feature um, will move to GA. So the, the GA block will come out soon after 1.30 release. Now let me talk about backup repository and Cozy. Backup repository is a repo that you can use to store your data and metadata. This can be uh, a object store or a NFS location. It can be either on-prem or in the cloud. And there is this project called Cozy Container Object Storage Interface, trying to uh, introduce uh, object storage into uh, Kubernetes. It provides APIs to provision buckets and also allow the bucket to be used by the pods. So there are a few cozy components. There is a cozy controller manager that validates and binds the cozy created buckets to bucket cleans. And there's a sidecar that watches the cozy Kubernetes API objects and calls the cozy driver to provision buckets. And there is also a cozy driver uh, that communicates with the storage backend and provision buckets on the storage backend. And there are uh, a set of uh, APIs introduced in Kubernetes. The relationship between bucket, bucket claim, and bucket class uh, is very much like that for the PV, PVC, and storage class. And we also have bucket access, bucket access class 
uh, then that allows your pod to consume the bucket. We also introduced uh, new gRPC interfaces for you to uh, provision the buckets. So this feature right now is alpha. We are trying to move it to beta. We have uh, a weekly meetings, so join the meeting if you are interested in this feature. And I mentioned earlier that uh, you want to quiesce the application before taking snapshot and unquiesce afterwards. But what if uh, it is not possible to quiesce the application or if it is just too expensive to quiesce the application, but you still want to be able to take a crash consistent snapshot. And also the application might require snapshot uh, to be taken for multiple volumes that are part of the application at the same point in time. That's when a consistent group snapshot comes into the picture. We introduced a new Kubernetes APIs. There's the volume group snapshot, that's a user names, namespace object. Uh, it represents user's request for group snapshot. And we have volume group snapshot content that represents a group snapshot on the storage system. And we have volume group snapshot class that defines the type of uh, group snapshot you want. That is defined by the admin. And we also have CSI spec changes. We introduced a new group controller service. And then we also introduced the new gRPC interfaces for you to create, delete, and get volume group snapshot. So this feature was first introduced in 1.27 uh, 1 release, and we continue to work on it. And we finally finished the implementation in 1.29 release. So now let me hand it over to Dave to give a deep dive on CBT. Thanks, Ching. <clears throat> um, so change block tracking. So. When we do um, snapshots currently, so change block tracking is a complement to the existing CSI snapshots. So if we take a snapshot today, after we've snapshotted the volume, uh, often we'll want to export the data. And then what we'll do is you clone the volume, and then you have to either uh, mount it as a file system and work through the file system and find changes or compare that against what's in your backup repository. Or you can try to do a block mode export but again, you don't know what's changed. You just have, uh, you're just reading blocks. Uh, you can do some dedupe on the back end, but it requires a lot more I.O. Many of the storage systems that Kubernetes is running on top of will actually keep track of what the differences are between two snapshots. So this is, so our change block tracking API is a way to standardize and expose those interfaces from different storage vendors through CSI up to a Kubernetes backup application. So as you can see here in this diagram, you know, say we have um, a snapshot, we took the T1 snapshot, and then we ran for a while and blocks two, six, eight, and nine got modified. Then um, we take another snapshot, and then we can ask and query the system, hey, what changed? And it'll give us back that list of changed blocks. So that's, that's where we started from. And this gives us um, much faster backups because obviously we don't have to pull all the data out. Um, we don't have to deduplicate it. We don't have to store it. So we know what's changed. Um, we obviously want a more generic interface so that uh, backup providers don't have to do storage system specific integrations. That's where we've been up to this point. We've seen you know, a number of different backup applications are doing storage system specific um, integrations, but it doesn't, it doesn't cover everybody, and as things change, you, know, you have to go back and update the backup applications. And you know, we've got other things we have to do in here, like full backups and uh, integrate with the storage system. So this has been the, uh, the project, uh, one of the major projects in the data protection working group for, I don't know, what, two years now? It's about two years. Um, and we've gone through a lot of discussion, design. Uh, we've had a lot of community involvement, which has been fantastic. And so we've wanted to define 
um, change block tracking for CST or for CSI. And then we also had to discuss, you know, there's security implement implications of this as well. Uh, we looked at various approaches. Um, in like a worst case scenario, you can wind up with say five gig of change block tracking data um, on a one terabyte volume, you know, is the difference between two, two snapshots. So we had, to we had to find some ways to get that out without um, overloading things like the API server. Now, so far, we haven't um, defined a data path for directly accessing snapshot data that uh, may come in the future. So our data path is still going to be attaching a clone of a snapshot, a volume created from a snapshot to read the data. Um, and we're not yet doing things like um, being able to tell what files in a file system have changed. So we went through a number of different approaches to this. Uh, kind of we started with, let's just put all the data in as uh, custom resources. When you asked what we could have the CSI driver populate the custom resources, but that rapidly ran into space problems in the API server. You know, as I said, there's about up to say five gig, which is a lot more than you want to plug into your API server, especially when this is like for each chain uh, pair of snapshots that you're comparing between. We looked at an aggregated API implementation where we would have the CSI driver um, provide virtual resources into the API server. But then again, we ran into concerns about how much data was going to be pushed through the API server, even though we weren't storing it there anymore. And so what we wound up at was more of an imperative interface where we can connect directly to the CSI driver and query it. So where we're, we're going to is this gRPC service that you can attach to with authentication via the API server. So this is a little diagram of, of how things would work. So you've taken a couple of snapshots and now you're looking to export data. So your backup system is gonna go ahead, step one, it's gonna get a token from the API server. Then it's going to execute a gRPC against the, um, the interface of the CSI driver, which, we'll, which we've exposed. That then uh, verifies the token with the API server, uh, verifies the snapshot IDs. So when you do the get delta, for example, you'll give two snapshot IDs to compare against. We'll verify the snapshot IDs and then go ahead and call into CSI. So we've added some new calls into the CSI spec down below to support this. The data will come back and we'll stream it back to the backup system. And it can then use that to make decisions about what blocks to actually copy and back up. Uh, you'll notice in step two, there's actually two different calls. One is called get delta, which will get the differences between two snapshots. And another one is called get allocated, which will simply return the list of blocks that have been used so far. So for example, like on your first backup of a disk, uh, traditionally we'll do a full backup, but you know, quite often disks are not fully used. So if the storage system supports it, it may tell us, yeah, you know, yeah, you, you wanna do a full backup, but reality is only these, you know, 10 gig of storage in your terabyte volume have actually even been written. So you can just start from that. So that's uh, another one of the features in there. So where are we today? So um, we've got a cross-company, um, you know, community-driven uh, team. So uh, it was originally started um, by a person from Dell EMC who's since left um, the Kubernetes stuff. Uh, Ivan Sim is now at Dell EMC. Prasad Gongol and Carl Braganza are from Veeam. We've had input from pretty much everybody in the DP working group, uh, people from Red Hat, people from Dell EMC, people from HP, IBM. Um, so that's, I think it's been a really good um, uh, collaborative effort. So we're still targeting get the KEP merged into 130, may or may not make it, we'll see. 
um, but it's under review. We're still taking comments on that. We have uh, made the modifications to the CSI spec and gotten those merged and actually merged the code to support those. We have a prototype of this working at this point, and we're planning to start, set up a new repo for the, um, the CBT work under Kubernetes CSI, because this is going to be alpha for a while. We didn't want to merge that in with the existing um, GA code. So then back to the working group in general. Um, you know, we're starting to wrap up on change block tracking, which has been a major effort. Uh, we're looking for places to go next. So one of the, uh, the areas of discussion right now is replication and how we can leverage storage system features that would allow us to control replication of volumes between storage systems. There's some proposals on that. We want to look a little higher up the chain and look at things like how can we actually replicate Kubernetes resources or hook up applications so they can replicate. We published our first white paper was on the needs for backup data protection in Kubernetes, when you need it, why you need it. Now we're thinking about putting together another white paper which would explain uh, how you make your application backup, restore, aware. So there's some, there's some tips, you know, there's some tricks there because often, you know, you'll be in like a crash consistent state. So your application has to recover from that. So we're thinking about putting together a white paper that would lay out what all the, the tricks are and things you can do. So we'd love to have people get involved. Uh, this is not just for people who work on data protection software or storage systems. Uh, we'd very much like application developers. We'd like end users to give us input. You know, what do you need? What do you see as, you know, directions we can be going in? So we have our home pages here. We do a, a meeting every two weeks on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we have the mailing list and the Slack channel. And I think... Right, we're supposed to have a QR code. Oh, well. <laughs> I think that's... That's it for our uh, presentation. We're happy to take any questions you might have at this point. Thanks. Um, over here in the white. Uh, going to your disaster recovery, um, I mean, are there any specific um, like projects that you're looking at or that you're using. <clears throat> I mean, I was thinking of, you know, Canister or um, I was thinking also, uh, you know, your, um, uh, not Ka uh, the um, Ka Kasten K10, for example. Uh, how does that come into play? Or are there, is there still a huge menu that you can use that you're looking at? Um, so we are not like prescribing backup systems from the working group. So we, we have vendors from, you know, multiple different backup applications, Dell EMC, Veritas, ourselves at Veeam Kasten. Uh, so it's not really appropriate for us to say, hey, this is the best one. Though obviously what I work on is best. But, um, so yeah, so there are a number of products out there. Um, we do have open source projects like Canister, uh, Valero as well, that can handle this. Uh, you're certainly welcome to come by and discuss you know, like what would work for you, or, you know, we can give you some recommendations. You the usual grain of salt, right? I mean, if I'm talking about K10, obviously I'm going to talk up K10. Where do you find the, you cited a white paper, though, for the storage. Where, where do you find that white paper? Uh, it's on our homepage, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, if you go to this uh, homepage, you'll find it. On the repository, the GitHub repository? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's actually checked in as a Kubernetes thing in, in okay. Git. But yeah, you can get it from there. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Over here. That's, that's option. So the question was, will the changes in the CSI driver to support CBT, will these be required or optional? So those are optional. 
in C if you look at CSS spec, actually, uh, there are very small number of APIs are actually required. I think it's only like mount on mount. Um, the rest of them are optional. Yeah, this is definitely an advanced feature. Okay, well, um, we can go ahead and wrap up then. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, you know, if you do have stateful workloads, we'd advise you, you know, we ask you to come check out the group, take a look at the white paper, see if it makes sense for you. If you have com comments, you know, we're, we're open to them and we'd love to see you come by the working group and just, you know, tell us what you need or what you think about what we're doing. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks.